Hi, it's Kat Powers from the Somerville Media Center, and we are here with the City Council Update with Matt McLaughlin. How are you this fine day? Doing all right, Kat. Welcome to the show. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Yeah, you're you're the veteran here. So oh, I'm yeah. the new, you know, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm the new executive director of the Somerville Media Center. Um, I uh, first met Matt. Uh, when I was at the Somerville Journal, I was the reporter and then editor there for a while. Matt, you were doing a couple of things, not in this country. Yep, yep. I remember many years ago, but I, I was still thinking about Somerville even then when I was writing stories in Iraq uh, and sending them back to the papers. So. It was all good stuff. All right. So uh, present day, now that, uh, now that you're counselor, and I have this note to call you counselor and not alderman because I've slipped a couple of times. Uh, it's since I've come back to Somerville, there have been some changes. What's going on right now with the council this week? Oh, a lot going on. Uh, so people can find the agenda on the city of Somerville's website, somervillema.gov. Uh, a couple of things that I'd highlight of uh, items that I've put forward. Uh, Councilor uh, Jesse Klingen and I put forward an order requesting information about how to draft an ordinance or develop a formal policy around decriminalizing or deprioritizing the possession of uh, small amounts of drugs uh, as opposed to distribution or, uh, with, or intent to distribute. Uh, so we're doing this uh, to address the war on drugs and address the fact that arresting people for harming themselves uh, may not be the best path forward. It, it's costly, it doesn't save lives, and we're trying to focus on prioritizing treatment over incarceration. And one of the things I hear a lot of people, um, some people pushing back, uh, concerned that we're becoming too lax with substance abuse. And for me, it's about the exact opposite. It's about finding a way to prevent substance abuse without locking people up and sending them to jail and uh, making them become better criminals, essentially, people who are, um, have a physical health problem. It's a, it's a disease and not a, something that people should be arrested for. So which we're going to bring that up and that'll go to committee and we just want to discuss the possibility. We already know that the Somerville police don't arrest many people for simply for position, possession as opposed to distribution. Uh, but we'd like to develop something formal around that. And then the other big item I have is a resolution, which usually I'm not a fan of resolutions, but this one has some teeth to it, uh, asking for $6 million from the federal government uh, to get sound barriers along I-93 and retrofit people's homes with air filtration systems. And this is part of a decades long issue regarding uh, fine particle pollution on I-93 which is the biggest public health issue in the city outside of COVID right now. Uh, the, we have data that shows that this fine particle pollution is affecting people's respiratory systems, uh, making them sick, and something like sound barriers and retrofitting homes will go a long way. And this is a request for, from the federal government and our Congresswoman Ayanna Presley uh, to try to get money in this year's budget to address this issue. So those are my two big issues. And then there's a lot of other good items on the agenda. Well, let's go back to your uh, your request to deprioritize the drug possession. Is it particular drugs? I would say all drugs. And that's kind of one of the things that came up is people thought we were talking about just marijuana. It's like marijuana is legal right now. Uh, so people shouldn't be getting arrested for possession. Uh, it is still not legal to smoke in the public or to consume drugs in the public. And this would, be, this would be all drugs. And I'm talking about possession. Uh, I'm not trying to decriminalize distribution and uh, enable drug dealers to do their business. But I think when people get uh, in trouble for small amounts of drugs that they're using for themselves, uh, that they're only hurting themselves in these situations and putting them in jail and putting them through the criminal justice system as opposed to getting them help uh, is just not working. It's been a decades long issue since the war on drugs began. Uh, and now we know uh, that the war on drugs, the, the phrase which came out of the Nixon administration uh, was heavily based uh, in the concept of oppressing black people and hippies essentially, finding a way to, uh, to, to arrest them uh, for their political activity as opposed to their personal choices. 
So that's what this is about. It is it is including hard drugs, but I, I don't think it's a soft approach. I think it's a better approach. All right. So a couple of other things that are on the agenda. Councillor Ballantyne has been looking at the bars that were recently installed on uh, the benches in the tea stations, uh, notably Davis Square, but there are others. Um, I'm guessing that these bars, that there's, you know, big benches, there are big bars put there. I'm guessing it's not to deter uh, skateboarders. Um, it's, she's calling it hostile architecture benches. Uh, where are you on this issue? Yeah, I mean, besides the fact that they are hostile and the, the um, concept, this has been introduced in a few places to remove hostile architecture, which is there to basically prevent homeless people from sleeping on benches. Um, outside of that, they're just kind of ugly. And I don't see them serving much of a purpose other than preventing someone from lying down. And if somebody's sleeping on a bench at the tea station, maybe we should be offering them resources instead of forcing them uh, to go sleep on a sleep on a bench somewhere else. So I support removing these uh, ish, these obstacles, these literal obstacles to uh, homeless people. But it has to go much deeper than that too, because people they're sleeping on the bench for a reason, and we should be addressing that as well as uh, addressing the fact that we're trying to basically force homeless people to go somewhere else. Yeah. All right. Uh, also on the agenda, this is a story that goes back longer than you in uh, Somerville. So the murder of Deanna Kremen, uh, there is a request to get in, there was a request to get information from the district attorney, uh, Marion Ryan, on the investigation of the murder of Deanna Kremen. It's been 19 years, I believe, uh, since she was killed. Where what can what can the council do by keep by making these requests? I'm not sure. I, I, I believe that these requests are meant to just keep this in the public eye and make people not forget about that murder that happened many years ago. And I remember those days very well. Uh, so I think, you know, I think Council Klingen put this forward and he was a personal friend of Deanna. He knew her and knows her family. And I think he just wants this to not disappear. And I know that's how her family feels is they just don't want her memory to disappear. So requesting this information is just putting it on the district attorney's radar and the Somerville police radar that people haven't forgotten. This is a sad story. All right, moving on, we have an ordinance to regulate chemical crowd control agents and kinetic impact projectiles as approved by Legislative Matters Committee. So these are smoke bombs being uh, shot into crowds. What, what are these called? What, yeah, so what, is, what, what, do, what do all of us regular folks call these? I, this, we call this the tear gas ordinance. That's the all simple right. way of putting it. And this was put forward uh, by Council Ewan Camping in response to some of the actions that police took in Boston uh, during the George Floyd protests and other issues. Uh, so it's basically banning the use of tear gas as well as projectiles, or actually it's not even a ban, it's just limiting their use uh, and stating specifically what those uses can be. And it did expand into pepper spray as well, uh, explaining what circumstances police should use pepper spray and tear gas. Uh, and it should be noted that this was passed unanimously and I'm sure it's gonna to pass tomorrow. Uh, City of Somerville does not have tear gas and we don't have many of these items that are being prohibited within the ordinance right now. Uh, so I think it's more just forward thinking and uh, anticipating possible problems in the future. So this, this is passed and I think that it, it's a good ordinance, but uh, also, it does, we don't have tear gas. So it's kind of a, a, an issue for the future, I suppose. All right. Uh, I have, we have a question from a viewer, which is, what is the plan for Holland Street? Biking on Holland Street is like a combination of mountain biking and riding on the double yellow line on Mass Avenue. Uh, do, you, do you have a sense of the, the bigger picture for Holland Ave? No, I, I saw that he, I saw that comment on Twitter, and I would recommend they reach out to their ward counselor, um, and I would I would encourage them to take a ride on Pearl Street and see uh, see how bumpy that ride is. 
Uh, so when it comes to streets, uh, individual streets, that's usually the purview of the ward counselor. So I don't really have an answer to that. Uh, other than I, I feel your pain. I ride my bike everywhere and I have to, there's a lot of, there's a lot of terrain that are not, that is not suitable for a road bike. There is one on, I, on uh, right near the Argenziano School, if you're going toward the Somerville Media Center, where I swear, if you hit it right, your soul will leave your body. It is, I, and on, honestly, I, I might have had a time warp back into Cambridge hitting it. There's, the, the roads are serious. Is there, is there something coming up from the city to deal with the roads? I mean, the roads that if you look at the city's plan, they have a list of road pavers uh, and basically every every road in the city will eventually get repaved and they have a list of priorities for those roads. And sometimes it's frustrating because some roads that people think should be on the list are much further down the list, but that's more of a sign of how bad some of the other roads are. Uh, so I do know my, my neighborhood in particular I get a little frustrated because it feels like we're less of a priority than other neighborhoods like Holland Street, for example, uh, and West Somerville that uh, has much nicer roads than East Somerville, I'd say. Um, and I've been trying to get the city to focus on some of these more low income neighborhoods that don't get a priority because people aren't calling and tweeting about it. Uh, so it is, it, there, there is a list and the city's working on all of them. And I hope they get to all the ones that really need the help. All right. So this is a seasonal issue. <clears throat> Excuse me. The one of the other uh, we have uh, from uh, Klingon, Ewan Campen, and Nudergang counselors um, have put forward. Uh, and forgive me, I don't know if this is an ordinance or resolution uh, that the administration include a sidewalk snow shoveling plan, a program. In the FY22 budget focused on pedestrian streets, major north, south, and east, west routes, sidewalk corners and crosswalks with piles of snow, MBTA bus stops, and senior buildings. Well, it's pretty warm outside. I'm wearing short sleeves. There, we're, we're discussing snow in the uh, uh, fiscal year 22 budget. What, what are the creative plans that could help with the snow here? I mean, it just, I, I understand Somerville has to close. You know, when we're all having school in, in person, Somerville has to close because kids can't walk to school because the snow piles are higher than they are. There's just no place to put the snow. So what kind of, what kind of program could be put in place? Well, you know, there, there is a program in place that is not very well used or well publicized uh, that the city of Somerville uh, hires young people to shovel the walks of seniors and people who have uh, disability issues and can't shovel their own walks. So I do believe there was a program in place there um, that if, was, if it was well advertised and well funded and well staffed uh, could address a lot of these problems. I think some of the proposals coming forward, um, you know, there's a, it reminds me of why Prop two and a half exists to begin with. Uh, because I do believe that some of the prop two and a half for people don't know means the cities in Massachusetts can't raise their taxes more than two and a half percent a year. And I think some of the things that are being proposed would go well beyond that two and a half percent. The snow budget is one of the biggest budget items in the city already. Uh, and that is one of the, it is also the only budget item that we can actually go into debt over. So another issue uh, when it comes to taxes is the city must be level funded every year. We can't go into debt like the federal government does uh, with the exception of the snow, snow plow removal. So I think there's programs in place and I support finding ways to have seniors and people with disabilities uh, get their walk shoveled. But I also think that this is New England uh, and you know people are saying that this is about seniors but the city has gotten much younger than a few years ago. It's people of the average age is 30s to 40s. And now we're talking about the city shoveling people's walks. Um, and a few decades ago, people weren't expecting the city to shovel their walks for them when the population was much older. So I, the point of all this is, yes, we want to make sure people have accessibility. We also don't want to destroy the city's budget. And I think that there are, things in place that can help address these issues already. 
Well, should it be part of the budget? I mean, we plowed the streets. Should we, it be part of the budget that we plow the sidewalks? If you want to triple the budget, sure. If, if that would triple the budget. I, if, if there's just as many sidewalk miles as there are street miles in the city. So that's at least double. Well, it, 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 and there's, there's a sidewalk on each side of that street, right? Yeah, exactly. So we, we have hundreds of miles of oh, cell phone, sorry. Um, we have hundreds of miles of sidewalks in the city. So if, if we can find a way to do this reasonably without absolutely imploding the DPW budget, uh, which is already millions of dollars over budget at times and uh, is, is the most scrutinized budget in the city, then I'd support it. And again, I do think that there is a program in place that if we just put more emphasis on that, uh, everybody who is not able to shovel their walk on their own uh, can be serviced. All right. So we have uh, the, uh, among the things on the agenda, mayor's request, requesting acceptance of a $24,960 grant with no new match required from the Massachusetts Department of Fire Services to the fire department for the purchase of protective helmets and vests for firefighters responding to active shooter and active threat incidents. Uh, we all want to protect our, our first responders. Uh, is this something that happens in Somerville? Yeah, I don't know about this item. It'll probably be referred to the Finance Committee for discussion. So this is an appropriation from the city and we'll have more information about that after it's discussed in committee. All right, sounds good. So um, let's go back to your uh, particular matter um, that you are looking to the, uh, forgive me, the, um, I'm looking here at my notes. You're talking about uh, requesting federal funds for ultra fine particle mitigation so this is it, it, do you have numbers on what the asthma rates are like in somerville compared to everybody else who doesn't live near 93. i don't have the numbers on me but uh tufts university and the somerville transit equity partnership uh have studied this for decades and have proven conclusively that people who live along i-93 and mcgrath highway have disproportionate levels of asthma respiratory disease, heart disease, issues like this. Uh, so it is statistically proven and that will be a part of our um, bid for this money is pointing out that it's the low income areas with people of color in them uh, who live next to the highways who are being disproportionately affected by this. Uh, so yes, that, that data exists and it's uh, proven conclusively that this is a very serious problem. How long will it take to fix a problem like this? If you have, you know, we have we have a we have a congressman, we have uh, two senators, um, you know, we have a Democratic president who who might be supportive, but this has been an issue, been hitting Somerville for a long time. How how long does it take to fix something like this? I mean, it's been fifty years since the uh, since I ninety three and McGrath Highway dissected Somerville. Um, and back then people were fighting it then and they, they removed homes by eminent domain and cut these highways right through our neighborhoods. And East Somerville is an island compared to the rest of the city now. You have to cross a highway, whether it be I-93 or McGrath Highway, just to enter and leave East Somerville. Uh, so this has been a decades long problem and it's one that I've been focusing on since I got in office in 2014. Uh, so it's been several years now. Um, we've had several requests for appropriation from the state government uh, that have been approved and then nothing ever came of them. I know my state rep, Mike Connolly, has been requesting money and study research to uh, address this problem. So it's been, it's been a decades long issue and I'm hoping that I'm the one or we are the ones to get it done finally. All right. All right. So I told you I was going to ask you tough questions about Somerville. Sure. So we're in COVID times, not everybody feels safe dining inside a restaurant, uh, certainly not going to other people's homes and whatnot. So uh, give me your best options for takeout in Somerville. Oh, oh no, that is a tough one because I have too many uh, restaurants in my neighborhood. 
uh, and they'll all be upset if I pick the right, if I don't pick them. Um, but I always have to plug Rincon, uh, which is a Mexican restaurant on Broadway. Uh, it's my favorite in a city full of Mexican and Latin American food. I think it's the best. And I just went there yesterday. I had a nice lunch outside. Um, and yeah, I would definitely recommend them for takeout. All right. What's the best order at Rincon? Uh, well, they got Taco Tuesdays and you can basically get really cheap tacos then. Yesterday I had the chicken quesadilla. So it was very good, but almost anything you order is going to be great. All right. Uh, best, best outside activity in Somerville right now. Hmm. I guess, I mean, for me, I've just been walking and riding my bike everywhere. Um, and just wandering the neighborhood yesterday, I got on my bike and rode around the whole ward looking for double poles, uh, because the city says that they're working with Eversource to get rid of the double poles. And that was just a regular thing to do. I encourage people to get out and walk. Uh, and just explore different neighborhoods. I, I had, uh, I was showing some neighbors around recently and they weren't even aware of some of the streets that exist in the city. So I'm, I'm a big fan of walking and just getting out. Explain, uh, for those who are either new to Somerville infrastructure or Somerville in general, what is a double pole? A double pole is when there's an electrical pole and uh, someone decides instead of replacing that regular pole that needs to be replaced to just add another pole to it. And it's ugly and cumbersome and unnecessary and probably unsafe. Uh, and it's always impacts the uh, less affluent neighborhoods. So it's not the biggest issue in the world, but it is an eyesore and it should be addressed and hopefully it'll get addressed. Is this a new hobby of yours looking for double poles? No, no, I did it. I did. It's funny. I did it in 2014 when I first got into office. I went around and uh, made a note of all the double poles. And then I did it uh, just the other day, uh, just to follow up on it. They're all still there. Fantastic. The, the, the biggest issue with it is uh, you'll find with double poles and low hanging wires that a lot of the utility companies, uh, no one wants to claim responsibility for them. And oftentimes they don't even know uh, because they don't have in their database, which pole is which, which wire is which. So everybody says it's somebody else. Um, so that, that's, that's the issue we're dealing with is, you know, having to get the utility companies to take responsibility and then address the issue when it's a lot easier to just add a poll and walk away. Fantastic that there's this group effort to put to, 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 to get rid of these, to, uh, to, uh, you know, hold them accountable. Yeah, for sure. All right. Could you, uh, I know you're coming back in two weeks. Could you spend a few moments talking about um, your guests that you're, we're, you're going to bring next time? Yeah, so uh, we, the city of Somerville and the city council is working on a civilian review process uh, for police misconduct. Uh, and there's a guy named R. Mason that we hired uh, as an outreach coordinator uh, to bring people together to discuss the possibilities of this. And we spoke and he suggested that maybe we do a joint scat show together and talk about this and other issues going on in the city. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that conversation. So what prompted the need to hire somebody in that role? Well, I, of course, the George Floyd incident was the catalyst to a lot of these issues. Um, and the, some of, the city of Somerville has done a lot on police issues uh, long before that incident. And um, basically that, but that was the catalyst to this. And uh, council is like Lance Davis, Ben Ewan Campen, uh, brought this idea forward and we're discussing it. So it's basically making sure the people that police are accountable to the public for, for their actions. The recent um, meeting that was held, you know, a lot of, there, there are some people who do not feel comfortable um, uh, talking about their experiences, either with police interactions or, um, you know, talking about how they feel about the police because um, there, there has been a history of uh, our black and brown um, neighbors being targeted. Uh, is there a way to get folks engaged on this issue without, um, 
I don't know. If, it's not just making them uncomfortable. It's putting them at risk. Yeah, I think that's what this outreach position is about, um, is having a civilian led process. Um, and basically that, that's what we'll discuss in full next week. Fantastic. Uh, two weeks from now, the possibility. Yeah, but that is, that is the whole purpose of this. And Mason has gone around uh, meeting with all different community groups and getting their input uh, in a non-interrogational manner. So, and it's not being led by the police, it's being led by the public. Fantastic. All right. We've just got, uh, we've got about a minute left. What do you see coming for the city of Somerville if case numbers drop and everybody gets vaccinated? I mean, I, I'm always never been speculating on what happens in the future with regards to COVID because we have seen cases increase because people are getting more comfortable. And, um, you know, and the city has taken a harder line on COVID response than a lot of other cities. So I don't want to speculate on it, but I will say everyone should get vaccinated. And once we get there, I think we're going to be getting back to normal. And I look forward to that. I, I hope, you know, people still public service message, keep wearing your mask, keep staying distant six feet from people, wash your hands, don't touch your face. The same things that we've been saying since the beginning and we're going to get through this. Fantastic. So to get information from the city of Somerville about the COVID response, where do they go? You can go to somervillema.gov and there's an entire page listed there uh, to address COVID specifically. Fantastic. All right. Well, uh, I'm getting high signal here that we need to start wrapping up. And uh, so Matt, I really want to thank you for being part of this conversation. It is really important, especially in these weird times where we need to talk to each other in little boxes uh, to keep each other safe. Um, it has been fantastic that you've been able to continue with us here at the Somerville Media Center. Uh, look forward very much to you in two weeks, bringing a new guest. Oh yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. The all silver right. lining in all this COVID is that uh, things like this have become a lot easier. You know, you're absolutely right. It is, uh, there is certainly a greater appetite for video out there. What? Oh, that's telling me. Sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting the high sign. We got to go. All right. Good time. All right. <laughs> so fantastic. Thank you very much, Matt. I'm Kat Powers with the Somerville Media Center. We'll see you in City Council update in two weeks.